Welcome to the voice of Oceanside. As North County's only four-year university, Cal State San Marcos offers its local and out-of-state students a unique educational experience. Today, we'll hear what's new for the expanding university, how the STEM program works, and a bit about other programs aimed to meet students' needs. To begin our program, we have Dr. Karen Haynes, president of Cal State San Marcos. Dr. Haynes, thanks for joining us here on The Voice of Oceanside. My pleasure. You've been on here before. It's always great to hear about our, our local higher education. I'd like you to start by giving us a bit of background on what Cal State Marcos is and what it does, and touch on how it may differ from other Cal State locations. Would love to do that. As probably you know, we began in 1989, took our first class in 1990. So we're a relatively young public university, one of 23 in the California State University system. Today we're 10,200 students strong, and today we also serve about 500 students in addition to that 10,000 not on state appropriated funds. We have a university... Can, can, you, can you flesh that out a little bit? Uh, what, what, what are the details of that category? That second category really means that we've found creative ways, often through partnerships, to provide academic programs to students that the state doesn't help us pay for. For example, we launched a master's program in biotechnology. We launched our master's of science in nursing. No state dollars to support those programs. But vital to our region's um, workforce development, and we then can serve additional students through the state appropriations. Our entire Temecula off-campus center is also funded through what we call a self-support mechanism and through partnerships with the cities of Temecula, Murrieta, and the public school um, system. So we serve more than just what the state pays us to serve, which is how, in answer to the second part of your question, probably how we are relatively unique within the system because we grew up in this region saying that we really wanted to look at the future workforce needs of this region partner with the region and try to determine how to develop curriculum and delivery mechanisms that really would serve the workforce of the future of North San Diego County and Southwest Riverside. So that's a level of responsiveness that people might not normally associate with a, a government university or a publicly funded university. I suspect so and it's been one of our hallmarks. We say we're in a community engaged university and we really have intentionally been that because we think it's both a responsibility and we think it certainly has helped us through these partnerships to serve this region better. After a number of years of doing that are you having businesses seek you out at this point for advice and consultation? We're having, we're having businesses seek us out for, for that. We talked about we also have a senior experience program that is in high demand for um, utilizing our undergraduate students for real-life business projects. But I would also say that we are increasingly in demand for people who want to partner with us in other ways, like the cities of Temecula and Murrieta, who see us as more entrepreneurial, more flexible, and more adaptable than one would normally think of a public higher education institution. Does this, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this one, uh, does this require the engagement of almost everyone there? I, 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 or is this just a um, limited to yourself and a, and a few people who do this outreach? Oh, no. It, it is across the university, both a commitment to that philosophy, and it usually engages a lot of people, administrators, faculty, and staff, to actually find, nurture um, partnerships, and then actually deliver on those partnerships. And the other partnership that I didn't talk about, but certainly important that differentiates us from many public higher education, is our memorandum of agreements with our public school districts. And Oceanside is one of those school districts that we have reached out and partnered to and guaranteed Oceanside Unified School District students who go through a program and are college ready, a guaranteed slot of admission into Cal State San Marcos. And that's a really important commodity this, these days when we have 2,500 slots and 17,000 applications. 
Is this something that you inherited, or is this a, a, a hallmark of your, I believe you're in your eighth year? I'm in my ninth year now. Ninth year, okay. Yes. So is, is this your development, or is this um, longer term than that? No, it's mine. And in 2004 and five, we really refined and refocused the strategic priorities of the university. And within above those strategic priorities, one of my real commitments to this region was to, with the region, raise the educational attainment rate of this region. And these MOUs are really an essential part of helping to raise the high school graduation, college going rate throughout our region. You know, if you put these two things together, the, the two major things we talked about, you, you are really coordinating it at both ends. You're, you're connecting with the high schools on the intake end, and you're connecting with local industry on the graduation side of it, which increases the chance people would stay to work here. Yes. And another significant piece of Cal State San Marcos that differentiates us from the other San Diego public uh, higher education institutions is 85 percent of our graduates stay in this region so when they come to us they stay here so when we say that investment in Cal State San Marcos really is an investment in this region because it, we really are the workforce of today and tomorrow okay. and that that's part of an ongoing trend of people staying more local given housing situations yes. yeah you have some issues facing your campus, just like every other campus does, and, and top of the list, of course, is the budget situation. Top of the list and several, <laughs> and, yeah. and several parts of the yeah. list down, yes. We've, you know, all of the California State Universities have now had increasing number of cuts, and we face likely another cut if the governor's initiative doesn't pass in November. We are planning for another $5 million cut at Cal State San Marcos for next year, and if we have to take that cut. That will be a total of $17 million cut to our state appropriation in the last two and a half years, and that's significant. Can you translate in that into uh, a number of students or a number of classroom hours? How do, how, how do we give people a feel for what that means? Well, let me translate it a different way and see if this works. The, the budget that we have today in 2012 is equivalent to the budget we had in 1998 and we were serving half the number of students. So we have doubled the number of students and reduced the budget significantly. So we are obviously increasing some class sizes, reducing some of the, the section offerings per semester and we found some of the creative ways to move some of the academic programming off state support. I'm going to assume that most of the low fruit on those kind of efficiencies has been picked, and people have a right to know <laughs> if people clamor for further reductions in support of education, what are the consequences? They are going to find that we'll turn more students away, more qualified local students are going to be turned away. The ones who are admitted are going to probably move through to graduation slower because there will be fewer sections and courses available. And we may also, and this is a Board of Trustees decision, but we may, the Board may choose and need to increase tuition again. The options are all not good options, but there's only a finite number of options left to us if the state continues to deinvest in higher education. To put a real fine point on it, when we talk about longer to get through, we're talking about probably a fifth year or more? Exactly which delays your chance to recover your educational costs, of course, because right. you're, not, you're not employed. And I would say to you that the other thing to think about is that our student population, 50% of them are first generation in college students, and 45% of them are students of color that pretty much mirror the demographics of the region we serve. So these are students, A, who are not necessarily going to be able to choose to go out of region and have other kinds of opportunities at higher cost or out of state institutions. They are students who, if are, they don't get educated, are likely going to reduce the economic vitality of this region. Do you see uh, an opportunity to increase this other source of funding uh, to any radical level, or are we really dependent on some changes at the political level? Well, I think we're mostly dependent. 
with changes at the, at the political level. We can change some more. We can be more creative. We are constrained by some of our system policies on how much we can push at the margins. So we continue to look for those places where we can uh, offer, offer courses or offer state support, develop new courses and launch them, not on state appropriations. But we're running out of options. Both we're running out of options of how to reduce and cut our own budget, and we're running out of options about how much more we can provide opportunities outside of the state appropriations. So we really are pushing harder at our legislators to suggest that they certainly not de-invest any further and that they reinvest and provide some of the monies back to us so that we collectively as a system and we at Cal State San Marcos can grow and serve the population. I would also say to you that the California Public Policy Institute has said there will be a gap of one million people by 2020 in California who will need to have a baccalaureate degree for the workforce of that time. So we have that gap ahead of us and we have public higher education having to turn away qualified Californians. However, within those limitations you've got, and, and I've been there, you've, you've got a vibrant uh, uh, center there. Um, there has been some growth, yep. athletic programs, for example. Yes. Well, and there's also been building growth. I came, when I came in, the, in February of 2004, I cut a ribbon on the seventh building at Cal State San Marcos. Three weeks ago, I did groundbreaking on the seventh building since I have gone there. So we have built seven buildings, or b broken ground for the last one, in the last seven years. So there is real growth in buildings, real growth in student life, and there's been some growth in academic programming despite the worst times public higher education has ever known. Do you see uh, any, I'm, I'm not even going to ask, is there a quick end to this, but do you see a long-term solution that's on the table, or are we not even at that point yet? I don't see it in California, and I, don't, I have not seen it very much nationally. I mean, we are not the only state that is de-investing in, in higher education. I think California, the issue that has really made it more national attention is we were the beacon for the nation with the California Master Plan for, for Public Higher Education. And for decades, we were advanced in terms of the way we funded and supported public higher education. We are obviously not there anymore, and I don't see a quick fix coming. Well, luckily, we're only at the end of our segment, not at the end of the show, because we need to talk about some positive stuff, and we will. When we come back, uh, we will be joined with Michael McDonald, developer of North City San Marcos. Stay with us. Did you vote in the last election? I know I would have. I would want my voice to be heard. You see, the only way your ideas can count is for our elected officials to hear from you. My dad says it's easy. Just learn about the process and vote. So you have all this power to really make a difference. And you didn't take time to vote? Am I missing something? Learn how to make your ideas count by logging on to www.representativedemocracy.org. Welcome back to this segment of The Voice of Oceanside. We're joined by Michael McDonald. Michael, we will have some questions for you, but I'm going to do some follow-up with Karen from segment one. Um, would you like to expand a little bit on how you're meeting you and, and perhaps even other presidents of universities in California? Uh, w what are you doing about the shrinking resources that <coughs> seem to have no end in sight? One of the things that I didn't talk about earlier was also trying to push the use of technology in ways that we could uh, provide access to more students through online delivery, obviously. We do a lot of hybrid delivery on our, our campus, but I'm one of four presidents system-wide that are trying to build models so that we can provide some entire degree programs online, some of which would be likely not on state support, and that perhaps we could also provide just individual courses to students so that they could move through to degree faster. So those are additional ways of trying to sort of shore up both students' progress to degree and maybe even offer some additional degrees not on the state dime. 
You know, there's no doubt that online is an option as, as a budget relief issue. Do you have a sense of how students view that? Would they view that as a, as a plus? Is that something you get comments about? We'd like that. Or do they, have they voted with their feet when they enroll at Cal State San Marcos? And would they prefer the in-class environment? I think students, like probably any of the other constituent groups, are, are a mixed model. Our students are not all 17, 18-year-olds. Some of them are returning after all kinds of life experiences. Some of them would like to have that, like to have the option of just taking one course online so that they could move through quicker. Some of them would opt to take more of that um, online. And just as they're doing in Temecula, some of our students have voted literally with their feet or their cars to say we would rather stay closer to home, Southwest Riverside, and take courses or degree programs when offered there. So it's a, it, it, you might be forced into it or encouraged to do it for budget reasons, but there could be a customer satisfaction issue as well. well. I think there will be. I think there will be, and I think as long as we make multiple models and maybe these two places available, that students will vote differently, but that we will overall satisfy more people. And the other thing I want to go back to, uh, we talk about buildings, and I'll play devil's advocate here. We talk about budget crunch, and then we talk about buildings. So explain to us how those buildings are necessary and fit in, even in light of the budget issues we've talked about. All right, two things. One, most of the buildings that have been built on, at Cal State San Marcos in the last eight years were built not on state appropriations. Buildings like our student union for example, is built, will be in built entirely with student union fees. Our parking garage structure was built entirely by parking fees that both pay for it now and retire the debt over a 30-year period. So the majority, our built, one of the buildings was the Center for Children and Families, and that center was entirely built by uh, First Five Commission funding. So all but our Social and Behavioral Sciences building opened just this past summer, which was state bond building. All of the rest of them have not been state-appropriated funds. Well, there's a, there's a great answer. There's yes. an important <laughs> distinction between the, between the two. Yes. Uh, Michael, as advertised, um, tell us about the Quad and tell us about North City. Well, let me start with the Quad, if I may. Uh, the Quad is a student housing project that we're building literally right across the street from the campus on the north side of, uh, of Barham. Um, it is composed of uh, 110 apartments. It's an apartment-style student housing with approximately 600 beds. And uh, so what you have is in each apartment you have a full kitchen. We have a full bathroom for every two beds that are in the unit. Um, and you have roughly, I think it's 60% uh, are double bedrooms and 40% are single bedrooms. And um, hopefully we're not doing a disservice to the education of these students because uh, we have built in uh, lounge areas um, and classrooms areas and exercise facilities and a swimming pool. So it's, it's uh, I think, quite a terrific environment that we're creating for the students. The quad itself is um, the first vertical development of a much larger project, which is this North City project. And the North City project uh, is made up of about 150 acres and is uh, designed to be a true mixed-use environment or community. So we will have um, a, a large retail Main Street uh, area, um, again, directly across from the campus. Uh, we'll have uh, a lot of residential units. Um, uh, we'll have um, uh, up to a million square feet of, um, of office as a uh, component of this. So it, it's meant to be a true mixed-use uh, environment. Now, is this a, a formal partnership or an informal partnership between North City and Cal State San Marcos? This is a true public private partnership. North City is, is entirely privately owned, um, but we have been working very uh, closely with the university in terms of trying to integrate uh, what our activities are and what some of the needs are of the university. I think I can say that this is, this is a true 
in my mind, true win-win situation. I think we provide a, um, a very interesting environment which will help the university, and by the same token, having a today 10,000 student higher education campus right across the street from our development, and a campus which will be growing to 25,000 students in the foreseeable future, is a truly a, a unique opportunity for any community. And how, how did this come about? Is this modeled after something else some other Cal State is doing? Or is this the prototype? This model is, is fairly unique within, within our system, has been the prototype. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would echo what Mike said. It really is both a really wonderful public-private partnership and the beneficiaries are our students. The formal part of the partnership between Cal State San Marcos and North City Development is we literally have a written agreement that also puts the management of this, the student discipline, the management, the academic programming is ours. So we are responsible for those pieces and it will be the same as the 600 bed facility that's on our campus. So students will feel and have the same opportunities on either side of Barham but it will be both part of a significant part of the multi-use um, North City right. that Mike is <clears throat> developing. So this has the potential to have a regional impact then? Uh, by all means. The reason we picked the name North City <clears throat> is um, we're trying to create a sense of place which doesn't exist anywhere in North County. We want to be the urban environment that will service the entire North County um, San Diego area. Um, it, it starts with a Main Street theme retail, which will have residential and some office above the retail, uh, broad sidewalks, heavily landscaped and outdoor furniture where you can have outdoor eating and uh, um, uh, with restaurants. Um, it, um, one of the things that we gain from the university is the excitement um, of students and it brings a, a sort of a vibrancy to any community. I think having students as part of um, this community, we bring, we'll be creating in, in my mind a true sort of college campus community right across the street from the university. So we think it will help the university so as uh, prospective students and their parents drive off of um, a somewhat congested Highway 78. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. you're kidding. Every now and then. Um, that they'll see this, this wonderful, um, uh, uh, you know, retail, residential area, and then this terrific uh, campus sitting on the hill, and they're going to say, I'm sold. This is where I want to go to school. And I think it'll help the university draw the very best students. And having the proximity of the university, I think, will just, again, give a real um, vitality to what we're trying to accomplish. The other thing it did for us, going back to sort of budget reductions, is the fact that we didn't build student housing on our land at this time because it's built across the street allowed us to go forward with, for example, the student union without hitting our debt capacity as an institution. So there's wins all over the place mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of this partnership. And we hope, I hope it is a prototype that other institutions will look at. And in fact, I know some of our sister institutions are looking at this as a model. How far along is this? Well, the first 300 beds are going to be ready for our incoming freshmen this fall, which means mid-August. Correct. Right? <laughs> and we have a second phase of another approximately 300 beds, which we expect to uh, deliver by August of 2013. And we're currently planning yet a third phase, which depending on the demand, we would hope to deliver either 2014 or 2015. So it really there is a function of the growth of the university. Yeah, this is really intriguing uh, to me. Uh, this has the potential to be a game changer in California to create a sense of space, a sense of urban space is very rare on the ground, you yeah. know, outside of Disneyland and, and maybe the Irvine Company. <clears throat> but this would be the real thing. Um, have you addressed in your planning the social issues? And, and has that been done in connection with the university? Is, have, do you work that closely together? Well, I've, if, I'll take a stab. Okay. What I was trying to say to you is in our agreement, 
we are going to be the managers of this student housing, which means student discipline is ours to deal with. Programming, social programming, as well as academic programming and tutoring will be ours to construct and deliver across the street the same way we do it in our student housing mm -hmm. on campus. So lots of that is something that a private developer probably wouldn't want um, to have the responsibility for, and we really should and want the responsibility for doing that kind of academic social programming and that discipline for our students so that we can continue to be also good neighbors um, within North City and beyond. I, I like to say that um, the presence of the students is both good news and bad news. <laughs> the good news is the vibrancy I mentioned. The bad news is their students and their <laughs> energetic and uh, and uh, we see it as a real advantage the um, uh, incorporation of the university's rules and regulations and the student life uh, environment because it keeps a certain control on the environment that we're creating and so we see it very much as a, as a positive and that's the reason we're dedicating um, you know, some substantial space within our project for classrooms. Um, and they're not so much oriented as true academic classrooms as much as they are uh, helping the students make the transition to that new student life that they'll have at uh, Cal State San Marcos. Well, I'm going to have to make sure I brave that traffic and drive out and see this, which which I want to do I, as I soon as I can. Will. I Maybe I'll go now, but we're at, we're at the <laughs> we're at the end of our segment. But I'm not leaving because we have more to talk about with Cal State San Marcos. We're going to take about a two minute break, and we hope you'll come back and join us. Diet and exercise are never easy. Then again. Neither is dying. Type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and stroke kill nearly a million people a year. You can stop it starting right now. It's your life. Listen to your doctor. Eat better. Get moving. For over 75 years, consumers and dental professionals have looked for the American Dental Association's seal of acceptance on products. The ADA seal stands for quality and effectiveness. Manufacturers who apply for the seal must meet certain criteria. They must provide objective data supporting the product's safety, evidence of purity and uniformity in manufacturing practices, and laboratory studies and clinical trials using guidelines set by the ADA to demonstrate effectiveness. All product claims made on packaging and labeling are approved by the ADA, so you can trust them. The seal is awarded for a five-year period. These products are continually re-evaluated to ensure safety and quality. To learn more and find a list of products awarded the ADA seal, visit ADA.org. For the ADA Dental Minute, I'm Dr. Maria Lopez Howell. Welcome back to the Voice of Oceanside. We are here talking about Cal State San Marcos, and joining us is Dr. Catherine Kinjardiff, Dean of the College of Math and Science. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Get a little nervous. You're going to talk about math, so <laughs> like everybody else, you know. Um, you're here to talk about the STEM program. Mm -hmm. Can you fill us in on what that is? What STEM is. So STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And collectively, the STEM disciplines are those disciplines that are typically located in a College of Science and Mathematics, which is our newly restructured college. I'm one of the five new deans on the campus. Um, we now have our own branding and identity for the community, um, declaring that we are a force to be reckoned with in the discipline and producing students for the workforce in the region. Uh, you, you bring up the term marketing. D do you think, and, and either one of you or both of you could answer this, um, that's not a term that's often connected with traditional universities, and yet you bring that up early in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Do you think you're doing a, a better job of that, of actually selling the concept of a particular degree program or a particular school? I would say yes, and part of, and then I'll hand it to Catherine, part of our 
restructuring into, into different configurations of colleges, or one, to connect to what we see future workforce needs, but also with the sense of then being able to better brand those degrees um, and market them beyond North County. And that restructuring and bringing in these deans has allowed us to do that. That is well said. I, I'm a native of California, and I've, I've been in the California State University for a number of years. Um, but the region here in North County has not really been fully aware of what we've had to offer in STEM disciplines. We place students. Uh, they're well-respected, well-liked, um, well-qualified. They do internships in the local companies. Uh, they go on to graduate programs, but it's been mostly by word of mouth that people find out about the great quality educational experience that our students get. And so part of this restructuring was indeed to declare to the community, yes, we are here, this is what we do, and this is why our students should be out in the workforce and you should take a look at them. The, the issue of science education has always been interesting to me because mm -hmm. we always seem to surprise ourselves you know, with the nightly headline, wow, we need science graduates. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask the same thing uh, because we seem to have to keep revisiting this issue. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and yet again, it's, it's the old story of uh, we're in a crisis. We lack these people. Mm -hmm. So um, how about we start with why it's important, then we'll talk about what you're doing to fill that need. Well, I think STEM is in a state where we're at a game change. Um, I'm, I'm a baby boomer. And I'm a product of that push in STEM education that came in the late 50s and early 70s, and I benefited from that. Uh, President Obama, in one of his addresses, pointed to the fact that we are at a defining moment, another Sputnik moment. But the game has changed because in the 21st century, it isn't just people who are going to become professionals in research or in academia that need STEM education. Everyone needs a STEM education. The National Science Foundation has indicated that 80% of the jobs that are going to be created in this decade are going to require science and math skills of some kind. And so it's very important that we not only educate our majors in STEM, but that we also educate our students in STEM-related activities so that uh, when they go out in the workforce, they're a scientifically literate citizenry that can make critical decisions in the ballot box, that can make uh, uh, valid decisions about news items and information that they hear about. And so it's very important for us to educate the entire student body in STEM. It's not just about training another professor. Yeah, that's an interesting approach, particularly how you ended it. Uh, it seems like there's a view out there that as science gets more complicated, at least from a layman's sense, that mm -hmm. it's very few of us who have to know a whole lot about it, mm -hmm. and that's about it. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're presenting that most of us need to know at least something about it. Yes, we do. And as President Haynes noted in the earlier segment, most of our graduates stay in the region, and we have a lot of science and technology in this region, and it drives the economy. Now, let's stay with the theme we talked about earlier about San Marcos being unique to some extent. What's unique about the undergraduate experience at CSUM in the sciences? Well, at CSUM in particular and in the CSU more broadly, all of our undergraduates are expected to engage in some kind of research project for their degree requirements, whether it is working side by side with a faculty member in the laboratory, or whether it is through a very laboratory intensive curriculum, which we offer at San Marcos, which is quite unique to our campus, or if they are out working in the industry as an intern, and also we have a, a fairly hefty component of service learning available to students, and they can go out and work in the community in STEM related fields as well. And I don't think I can underscore enough that the kind of undergraduate experience at Cal State San Marcos in the laboratory with the kind of faculties, particularly in STEM disciplines, but across the campus, is not mirrored uniformly in other universities, public universities, within or without the CSU. And it is a marketable set of skills in addition to the academic credentials. And I would add that this is so important to us as a hallmark of our curriculum and our university that we have an Office of Training, Research, and Education in Science on our campus that stewards large programmatic grants that support faculty and, and students in research in STEM. And also on our campus through another National Science Foundation grant in partnership with Palomar, uh, we have created STEM centers on our campuses which uh, support students in STEM disciplines and help them navigate the STEM curricula by providing tut tutoring centers and also supplemental instruction. So we, we hold this as a very high value in the College of Science and Mathematics. You know, I'd like to see if we could flesh out the, the laboratory experience. I remember uh, hiring people 
way back in, in an old career for Johnson and Johnson and you could for, for the softer skills the management skills mm -hmm. you could deal with people if you worked your way through school as a retail salesperson but when it came to the sciences and I'm not talking about the physician level you know mm -hmm. the the operating level of the of the facility there um, either on the production line or lower stages of research there's no way to get laboratory experience as, a, as an amateur you had to come in with a certain set of skills and that means lab work and that means budget obviously those are mm -hmm. expensive rooms C can you tell us about some of the projects and the nature of of exactly what this lab work is that people can expect to experience there and let me say one thing because that what when i referred earlier to one of our programs that we launched a master's program on self-support a professional science masters was built for the biotech industry in particular mm -hmm. and was built to try to allow students to come in from either the business management side or the science side and get the other part, the other missing part of the curriculum. So one, it links back to what we're talking about is do we connect to our community and listen to what they need? Mm -hmm. And then Catherine can talk to you about what it means in our labs and what we mean for undergraduate research. But it was important the way we developed some of this in conjunction with the business community. And I think the important point here is that it's not just students through their coursework um, acquiring a theoretical foundation of the science. They're actually engaged in practical experiences through very rich learning environments in the laboratory. So they're not just learning about what a skill might be, they're actually practicing it in the laboratory, whether it's basic molecular biology, or whether it's applied physics and optics, or whether it's organic synthesis, or some sort of physical chemistry. Um, my discipline happens to be x-ray diffraction. These are things where the students pick up skills they wouldn't normally have, in a, in a standard university setting because our students, our curriculum is, is rich in these experiences and our students are expected to engage in them. Um, uh, beyond that, we have, as I mentioned, as you, you said that this is expensive because of budgets. We work really hard to bring in the funding to support the students in these activities. We have a number of training grants from the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which places students in research institutes in the area to learn about stem cell research. And they learn the techniques and the methodologies to engage in that kind of research. So they become, if we come back to the marketing, very marketable to the community, but they're a very skilled workforce. They can hit the ground running when they go out in the workforce upon graduation. Uh, you mentioned um, internships. How common is that? Of 100 students, how many are likely to have had an internship? It's hard to say among 100 because they will usually split themselves fairly evenly between doing service learning uh, projects out in the community, internships in companies, um, uh, research projects. In some departments, all the students have to complete a research project with a faculty member for the degree. So they will normally take that option, but there are others who will go out and work in companies as interns. So I would venture a good guess that probably at least 30 percent of our students do internships before they graduate. Do you have any... Uh, and that's in STEM. Any statistical, and for even anecdotal information, does this enhanced program, and I'll call it enhanced because it, your, your practical level is above what other institutions are offering, does that increase graduation rates? Are people more enthused because they get to touch something instead of just read about something? One of the arguments for undergraduate research is indeed the literature that has shown through longitudinal studies that students who engage in undergraduate research do graduate sooner and the retention rates are higher because they're actively engaged in what they're doing. They see the impact and they see the value and they see the practicality. They see the application of what they've learned in the classroom. And the learning goes on outside the classroom. And it's fun. And it's fun. <laughs> blow up I'll lab. put my scientist hat on. It's fun, <laughs> yes. It's very fun. And I'm going to assume that the employers can see that almost immediately. If someone's yes. touched something as opposed to read about, uh, having read about it or studied, it, it's going to make them much more Internships effective. Internships are also a testing ground for the student. And if they do well, the company will almost assuredly hire them the moment they graduate. Are you starting to get some where the circle's completed, where a graduate is now back looking to hire a student? Has it been going uh, on As a matter of fact, we are, yes. Yeah. I have, and one example is a member of my, my college advisory board who has started his own uh, consulting company in computer science in the area. And he actually comes back and sits in in classes to, to interview the students and recruit from our, our masses. Well, with this 85% of alumni staying in the region, I mean, that, 
that's a real powerful issue. Yes. Uh, many schools don't have that. Schools would love to have that, obviously, as you build that base. Yes, they will. Yes. So um, this, this level of responsiveness that you have in STEM and, and in other areas, um, is, is this something that other Cal State uh, locations are going to try and duplicate? Have you had people study this, come in and say, teach us how to do this? In STEM in particular? In STEM or in general. In general, I think our, our level and commitment to purpose of community engagement and partnership has been modeled elsewhere, and people do ask in various ways, how have you done that intentionally? And I don't know whether in STEM you've... you've well, having that. come from other Cal State campuses and coming to this region, what, the way I would, would describe it is that it takes a village to change things. And we are very much engaged and embedded in the community here, and we work with, this, with the education entities in the North County, and we're partnered with them. And not only are we taking students and doing research with them, but we're also working with teachers in middle schools and high schools to hone their skills and give them enriched professional development opportunities so that they can in turn teach with the contemporary skill sets and methodologies that we're delivering to our students at the university level. So it's very much a continuum. Well, you've effectively got the word out here. That's, that's for sure. I want to thank you for joining us. We're at the end of this segment, but not done with our discussion on Cal State. We will be back and we'll talk about veteran students. Stay with us. Many uninsured Americans are receiving free eye exams that may save their sight. Eye Care America's Glaucoma Eye Care Program offers eye exams for those at risk for glaucoma. The program is for U.S. citizens or legal residents who have not had an eye exam in a year or more and are determined to be at risk those eligible receive a free eye exam. To learn more, call 1-800-391-EYES or visit www.icareamerica.org. Welcome back to the Voice of Oceanside. Joining us is a current Cal State San Marcos student, Rick Enriquez. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure and having me. Relevant to our topic, you're United States Marine, and this topic is going to be about veterans and Cal State San Marcos. I will start with you, though, in, in deference to the role that we're on here. Um, you're signing agreements with local school districts, to, as you mentioned earlier, to guarantee admission to the university. Um, if they meet program requirements and admission criteria, why is this important? One, it makes them better prepared because they earlier learn what the pathways are to college. The school district can then help them to be successful in not only high school graduation but college readiness and third they come to us better prepared so less remediation and then for them it also puts them at the top of our admissions list and as I said earlier we have about 17,000 applications for 2,500 slots so important for the students their parents for us in terms of preparedness and certainly I think for the for the region because we have targeted school districts that represent um, challenged school districts where not a high percent of their population has been graduating high school college ready. Do you pick them, by the way, or do they petition you for this? Initially, in 2006, San Marcos Unified School District came to us. We crafted an agreement, and after that, we've had school districts literally lining up to want to talk about what the partnership entails. And so now we have six school districts with commonality, but also some unique pieces of the partnership that's unique to that particular school district's population or what they want to do. And I would say to you, because we've got Rick sitting here, that that is really targeting educationally at-risk students because we know that so many of the school districts here have that Percentage, low, low percentage of college-ready students. As we looked around and said, what is our mission at Cal State San Marcos? We really looked at a mission of getting people the most educationally at risk target populations, and they are veterans in high numbers. They are Native American students, and they unfortunately are a lot of the minority students in our public school districts. We think that's our game changer, to change that for the region and to provide the pathway to and the um, 
access and success for those, tar those targeted populations. Of course, veterans exist in a pretty high percentage in our local community colleges, so that's one issue, but you also have a partnership of sorts with Camp Pendleton. We do. So characterize that for us. Well, we have been, I think, for at least six years now, creating the kinds of pathways from Camp Pendleton, listening to them about whether it's active duty or veterans or dependents and what those diff three different population needs are in terms of degree programs, in terms of certificate programs, um, and in terms of us providing the, the support services, particularly for those veterans when they arrive at Cal State San Marcos. That today, that those years of conversations has yielded almost 10% of our students today at Cal State San Marcos are active duty veterans or their dependents. And we have the highest per capita in this California State University system. And obviously some of it is our proximity to not just Camp Pendleton, but multiple military installations in the San Diego, Southwest Riverside area. Well, Rick, you're one of those 10%. Yes, I am. So what are some of the challenges that you faced and that other veterans face when they go to college? Um, the 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 major challenge that, that's faced by incoming students is uh, the transition. Transitioning from military life to civilian life. Uh, coming from a, such a structured environment to more of an indi individual based. Even though you're taught to think outside the box and on the fly, you, you have more of a structure while you're, while you're, in, while you're in service. Uh, exiting service, everything's more self-reliant, self-efficient. So you have to learn how to be able to transition from, say, uh, having your housing provided for you, or your food, your meals, everything else provided for you, living in the barracks, to finding an apartment, uh, being able to provide your own transportation to and from work, uh, to and from school, whatever it may be, uh, finding that outside job or whatever it may be that, that makes that transition very hard. Another thing with that is <clears throat> the amount of services provided. Even though each, uh, each branch of service is uh, required to give exit, um, exiting training to transition, the information that's provided in those types of training isn't as much that's required. Uh, often they, they just give them the, the skin and bones of, of, of what's to be looked forward to in their transition, and they really don't provide as much information that's really needed. More of that is put on the individual and themselves to actually go out and really research this instead of having that package ready for them. One of the things that's inevitable, and it, it's, it's a fact, no matter who you are, um, you've had a number of years between high school and college. Uh, students who aren't, don't have a military background may or may not, but military people by definition do. Was that part of the challenge? And how many years was that for you, by the way? It was nine years. I did nine years active duty. Um, and yeah, the, the transition was hard. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to have a, a, a commanding officer that emphasized schooling. So where it was possible and where it fit into our deployment schedules, I would take a class here and there. But that the time, the time gap in between those classes was huge. You know, it would be one year, two years, whatever it may be. So I started at exiting service. I started at the community college level and then transferred over to Cal State San Marcos. What advice would you give to fellow veterans who are thinking about enrolling at Cal State San Marcos? Biggest thing is being proactive. Um, if you wait for the answer, you're never going to find it. Be as proactive as you can. Uh, research the GI Bill website. Contact uh, your local school, whichever schools you're interested in attending, preferably Cal State San Marcos. <laughs> but. Um, with that, each school has a different application process. Uh, each school has different benefit processes. So being in contact with your veteran center is one of the biggest things, and being proactive is, is the biggest thing that's going to help them to transition. Catherine, this one, this one is for you. In, in a way, um, it, there's the, because you have such a high number of percentage of veterans, there's a two-way education process going on. As veterans are learning what Cal State is like, or going back to school for that right. matter, you're learning what it's like to get students who have accomplished quite a bit between high school and college. Um, ha has that happened at Cal State? Is it integrated into the culture now? 
Oh, I think so. I think there probably was. We may not have been as prepared in the first year or two as we thought we were, but as we've, as we've had our veterans, in fact, help us, push us, if you were, um, Rick was talking about being proactive, push us to create a Veterans Services Center on campus. They've created a Veterans Student Association, and those have both pushed us to be more sensitive to provide different, different kinds of services to veterans, and I think what it's pushed for faculty and some of our students is the realization of a very different and unique life view, an experiential view that's being brought into the classrooms that is very different and enriching than we have had um, pr prior to this 10% that are now part of our student population. It really adds to our sort of our multiculturalism in a different way, if you will. Absolutely, particularly discussions in history classes and leadership classes. You know, you're you're a walking example to other veterans in that you've successfully accomplished the transition. But uh, to to sort of flesh that out a little more, can can you tell us about the positive side on how your military experience enhanced your college experience and your ability to learn? Uh, the military thrust young individuals into very mature situations. So having to be that young individual and learning how to deal with certain life issues or, or, or certain situations that, that may arise um, and being able to become that leader and step up to the plate uh, definitely um, helps that transition into, into a civilian life and, and helped me in, in my college process that it not only gave me a better understanding of course material, but it also gave me a better understanding of, of my fellow student, of, of, of the staff that's there. Um, you learn to appreciate things a lot more. So, so that overall, I guess, paying forward that they, that they provide you with in the military is, is, what, is what I think uh, truly made my experience you know, fairly easy. Does the, the, the one out of ten veteran percentage, does that give you a a comfort level that you think maybe would have been missing had you gone to a school where you were one out of a hundred, for example. Definitely, um, San Marcos was was a was pretty much my primary choice. It was my my first choice, but it was really the only choice that I was banking on. I didn't want to get lost into the numbers. Um, most of the military is is large throughout itself. The Marine Corps is fairly small in comparison to the Army, but. You still, it's still real easy to get lost in the, in the numbers. And I didn't want to be one of those persons. I wanted to be an individual that could be, be able to go up to an instructor at any time, you know, when class was over and get that one-on-one -on -one attention that I needed. And it's very easy to, to very easy and accommodating at Cal State to, to do that. First choice and only choice. See, that's the Marine way. <laughs> Don't you have a plan B? No, because no. plan A is going to work. It's one shot, one kill. Absolutely. Uh, you know, well, we, and let me say something, because <laughs> yes. I'm going to do a little bragging. We, are, we were both, um, in both military times and GI jobs, ranked as one of the most military-friendly universities. And we really have both listened to our students and really tried to make sure that we don't just attract them, but we can find increasingly and continuously find ways of supporting them so that they are successful, although what Rick described is what we also believe some of these students, these, milita these vets bring to our campus. They bring discipline, they bring perseverance, they bring tenacity, they bring focus. That is probably different from some of our younger students when they first come to us. It's the real world walking <laughs> in the door, right. which is something we only about have a minute left, but I, I, we've, we've been dancing around the theme of real world with internships and, and lab work that's relevant to the local community. You have a program that called SOAR, Student Outreach and Referral. Can you cover that in about half a minute? It, we initiated it this year, and what we realized is we really wanted a place that was a one-stop information place for students and parents, in fact. Any question that they could have academically, counseling, etc., one place that they could be accurately referred rather than bouncing students around from office to office. So we initiated it this fall. Anecdotally, I think it's working well. We haven't yet done the assessment, but it's unique, and I think it's an important service so students effectively get their needs met and their questions answered in one place, the right place. 
There's more to talk about, but there's no more time. I want to thank you for coming and for the great people you brought. It was enjoyable. My pleasure. And I hope you learned as well. And if you want to let someone else see this show, I want to remind you that this and all the other Voice of Oceansides are available at koct.org. Thanks for watching.